Bigfoot Classified contains content that is graphic in nature and listener discretion is advised. Bigfoot Classified relies largely on news documents, eyewitness accounts, press conferences, and interviews. Every episode is produced with respect to the victims, families, and communities involved. Some of the interviews, quotes, and broadcasts have been recreated. Numerous hours of research have been done regarding these stories. And if you have a theory, question, or feel that we've missed something, we encourage you to visit BigfootClassified.com. Bigfoot, also commonly referred to as Sasquatch, is a purported ape-like creature said to inhabit the forests of North America. This is Bigfoot Classified. Part one, we talked about Mount St. Helens and its history, in addition to several Bigfoot sightings that had taken place in the areas around the mountain. It has not been just once or twice that people have claimed to see these mysterious creatures. The sightings made such a huge impact that in time, parts of the area were named after Bigfoot, including Ape Canyon and Ape Caves. So it's not surprising that when Mount St. Helens erupted explosively in 1980, and caused devastating damage to both humans and animals, many were left to think about the fate of Bigfoot, especially when years after the disaster, stories of possible government cover-up began to circulate. The truth is, modern-day scientists and geologists were concerned about what was happening, and more importantly, what was about to happen. At Mount St. Helens, long before 1980, for example, the late William Pecora, a former director of the USGS, was quoted in a May 10, 1968 newspaper article in the Christian Science Monitor saying he was especially worried about snow-covered Mount St. Helens. The concerns were based on many different signs that suggested the mountain was most likely going to wake up from its sleep very, very soon. First of all, as mentioned in the previous episode, Mount St. Helens was young. Its visible cone was entirely formed within the past 2,200 years, well after the melting of the last of the Ice Age glaciers about 10,000 years ago. During that time, lava flows and domes were the main structure building the shape of the volcano thanks to numerous eruptions. Scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey have studied these lavas and other deposits and found evidence of dozens of major individual eruptions of Mount St. Helens. These active volcano episodes have been put under four different stages. Ape Canyon, Cougar, Swift Creek, and Spirit Lake. The latest stage, Spirit Lake, is further divided into six eruptive episodes, as that period is the youngest. There's been more evidence for the scientists to look back in time and document the events in detail. The Abe Canyon stage goes as far as the history of Mount St. Helens goes, from 300 to 35,000 years ago. This part is poorly known, but scientists have still been able to tell that volcanoism during the Abe Canyon stage produced a small cluster of lava domes with elevations of 4,000 feet. From 35 to 23,000 years ago, Mount St. Helen was dormant before the Cougar stage began. During that time, the mountain produced explosive eruptions with large volumes of ash in addition to lava domes and flows. A huge debris avalanche followed, placing a deposit 600 to 900 feet thick on the south flank of the volcano. This debris also dammed the Lewis River, causing flooding as far as the Columbia River. More explosive eruptions followed the avalanche, which eventually culminated in the largest lava flow in the history of Mount St. Helens. The Cougar stage ended 17,000 years ago, and for 4,000 years, the mountain remained quiet. Swift Creek stage took place between 13 and 11,000 years ago. During that time, 
Explosive eruptions produce two widespread ash layers and three extensive fans of volcano debris. By the time Swift Creek stage ended, Mount St. Helens had a cluster of domes with elevations as high as 7,000 feet. The current stage, Spirit Lake stage, began years after the mountain had been dormant for almost 7,000 years. Since then, Mount St. Helens has been active in six different periods. Smith Creek period, Pine Creek period, Castle Creek period, Sugar Bowl period, Kalama period, and Goat Rocks period. As mentioned before, the bulk of Mount St. Helens was constructed during Spirit Lake stage, and the profile of the mountain changed quite frequently thanks to intermediate volcanoism. In earlier stages, the volcano mainly erupted to kite, but significant amounts of basalt and andesite also erupted. All of these are kinds of volcanic rock with different characteristics and mineral content. Later periods included lava flows and a cluster of lava domes grew the mountain's maximum elevation. The early Kalama period was initiated by two large explosive eruptions in 1479 and 1482. Two powerful eruptions like that rarely occur so closely together. During the late Kalama phase, between 1620 and 1720, a so-called summit dome grew and gave Mount St. Helens its pre-1980 form. The last significant eruption of Mount St. Helens before the main event, which we are soon going to talk about, is believed to have occurred in 1857 at the end of the Goat Rocks period. There was no more change in the appearance of Mount St. Helens, but the eruptions during this period added the final pieces to the edifice and set the stage for what was about to come. So, in 1975, a group of scientists that had studied Mount St. Helens and its high frequency of eruptions over the past 4,000 years made a public statement saying that Mount St. Helens was the one volcano in the United States most likely to reawaken and to erupt, perhaps before the end of this century. This conclusion was followed by a more detailed report in 1978. These two publications would eventually be proven to have had one of the most accurate forecasts of the behavior of a volcano. Good evening once again everyone. Eight people are now known dead this evening following the massive eruption of Mount St. Helens early today. That eruption has radically changed the look of the peak, destroying a large portion of it. Geologists say this is by far the strongest eruption in the latest series, and it continues tonight. Channel 2's Essex Porter has the story. Geologists recorded the time as 8.32 this morning. Gas pressure building inside the mountain finally reached the bursting point. They think first there was an earthquake, registering five on the Richter scale. Then a split second later, the mountain started tearing itself apart. Four service planes have been flying as close as they dare to the mountain all day. But no one has seen portions of the north and northeast face. Tonight, officials say it's simply disintegrated. The area of what we had called the bulge for the last several weeks is the area that now is the opposite. It's a bowl-shaped depression. It's essentially an extension of the crater. The summit crater is much enlarged. The, the top of the mountain is not there because the crater now incorporates the area that was formerly part of the top of the mountain. And this crater now opens onto the north side, essentially it's breached to a very low level on the north side uh, to make this sort of open bowl-shaped depression, which is open to the bottom. And many pyroclastic flows have gone down into that bowl and swept out across the north side of Mount St. Helens and at least two and probably across Spirit Lake. On March 20th, 1980, Mount St. Helens experienced a magnitude 4.2 earthquake at 3.47 p.m. after several much smaller earthquakes that had started on March 16th as the first warning sign. The activity increased the following week, slowly at first, but then at about noon on March 25th, things began to get more dramatic. In the next two days, 174 shocks with magnitudes greater than 2.6 were recorded, in addition to many hundreds of more minor earthquakes. Those who lived close to the mountain felt the largest shock waves. Aerial observations were conducted and small avalanches of snow and ice were observed, but no signs of an eruption. Then, on March 27th, at about 12.36 p.m., 
A loud explosion or two close together were widely heard in the region. At this point, you were able to see Mount St. Helens beginning to spew ash and steam, making it clear that the eruption was really going to happen. Ash clouds rose about 6,000 feet above the volcano. The ash and steam ejection continued through April 21st in burst that lasted from a few seconds to several tens of minutes. At this point, there were two craters that eventually merged as the activity continued. Several avalanches of snow and ice darkened by ash followed and formed streaks down the mountain slope. In addition, seismographs recorded similar vibrations that had previously been associated with eruptions of volcanoes in Hawaii, Iceland, Japan, and elsewhere, suggesting that magma and gases were on the move within Mount St. Helens, thereby increasing the probability of magma eruption. Then, for a while, the mountains seemed to calm down in late April and early May, meaning there was no visible eruptive activity. But under the surface, magma intrusion into the volcano continued until the point when a large area on the north face of Mount St. Helens was visibly swollen. Through mid-May, about 10,000 earthquakes were recorded in the region, mostly directly unto the bulge. For two months, Mount St. Helens was bombarded by these earthquakes, erupted ash, and debris and experienced considerable and rapid deformation caused by magma intrusion. The bulge eventually collapsed, triggering the events of May 18, 1980. That morning, everything appeared the same as it has been for the last couple of months. USGS volcano expert David A. Johnston reported results of some laser beam measurements he had made, which indicated the status of Mount St. Helens had not changed. There was nothing unusual going on with the volcano monitoring data, including seismic activity, rate of bulge movement, sulfur dioxide gas emission, and ground temperature. None of these measurements gave any warning signs that a catastrophe was about to take place less than two hours later. One more earthquake was all it needed. It was just slightly greater magnitude than any of the other shocks recorded earlier but it was enough to trigger a chain of events as Keith and Dorothy Stoffel, who at the time were in a small plane over the volcano summit, described. We noticed landslidings of rock and ice debris inward in the crater. The south facing wall of the north side of the main crater was especially active. And within a matter of seconds, I don't know, maybe 15 seconds, the whole north side of the summit of the crater began to move instantaneously. The nature of the movement was kind of eerie. The entire mass began to ripple and churn up without moving literally. Then the entire north side of the summit began sliding to the north along a deep-seated side plane. I was amazed and also excited with the realization that we were watching this landslide in unbelievable proportions. We took pictures of the slide sequence occurring but before we could snap off more than a few pictures, a huge explosion blasted out of the detachment. We neither felt or heard anything, even though we were just east of the summit by this time. Mount St. Helens had woken up from its 123 year sleep. Needless to say, the pilot of the plane realized they were in great danger and put the plane into a deep dive to get out of the way of the rapidly mushrooming eruption cloud. The Stoffels were lucky to escape on time. Interestingly, although the thunderous blast was heard hundreds of miles away, many others in addition to Keith Stoffel reported they had not heard it loudly in the immediate area around Mount St. Helens. The literal blast tore off the top 1,300 feet of the volcano, leaving a new crater behind. The collapse of the north flank of Mount St. Helens produced the largest landslide debris avalanche recorded in historical time. Part of it surged into and across Spirit Lake, but most of it flowed into the upper reaches of the north fork of the Total River. The avalanche filled the valley to an average depth of about 150 feet. The total volume of the deposit was around 0.7 cubic miles. It also caused Spirit Lake's bottom to rise by about 295 feet and its water level by 200 feet. 
The ash cloud was blown 16,000 feet into the air and mushroomed vertically, traveling 60 miles per hour. It darkened the daylight skies in Spokane, Washington, and produced lightning and sparked forest fires. The ash emission continued until 5.30 p.m. and began to weaken by the following day. Over the next couple of weeks, the clouds circled the globe several times until the ash finally fell to the earth. Meanwhile, mud, ash, and debris combined with melted glaciers caused mighty mud flows that destroyed everything in their path as they rushed down the side of Mount St. Helens. Results were devastating. 57 people, including volcanologists, loggers, campers, and reporters were killed. Autopsy reports showed that most died of thermal burns or from inhaling hot ash. Many believe that due to the debris flow, the actual number of victims might be unknown. And of course, the wildlife of the area was hit hard. It is estimated that all birds and small mammals and up to 7,000 deer, elk, bear, and other big game animals were killed. In addition, local salmon hatcheries were destroyed. But if basically all the animals on Mount St. Helens were killed, except some of the burrowing ones, then what happened to Bigfoot? As we said before, Mount St. Helens area has been the location of multiple Bigfoot sightings, including the infamous Ape Canyon incident from the 1920s. One more sighting was reported by Kelly Shaw, whose grandfather told this story about his encounter with Sasquatch at Mount St. Helens in the 1930s. Back then, Mr. Shaw was in his 20s, and he and his friends used to go up to the lake in Mount St. Helens, most likely Spirit Lake. Every year, they had an annual backpacking trip, and this specific year, there were four other people going in addition to Kelly's grandfather. The trip took place during the fall. The group wanted the berries and stuff to be ripe so they could collect them in addition to fishing. It took Shaw and his friends three days to hike to the camping site at the lake. The following day, three of the friends went out to collect berries, and Shaw and the other friend went fishing. Sometime later, as they had already caught several trout, Shaw's hair on the back of his neck started to stand up. He felt uncomfortable, just like you feel when you're being watched. And not just that, Shaw also smelled something. He turned around and did not believe what he saw. Three giant hairy people standing at the edge of the tree line staring at him. Back then, Bigfoot was not yet pop culture. Nobody really had a name for this creature yet. Nevertheless, Shaw said that the largest of the creatures was about eight feet tall, and the other was seven feet, and the smallest one was about the same size as him, so around six feet tall. But even though one of the creatures was the same height as Shaw, it was otherwise bigger. It had broader shoulders, a thicker chest, just overall massive. Shaw did the best he could to hold back his panic. According to Kelly, his grandfather then thought about why these creatures were there in the first place. What did they want? Perhaps they were after the fish. To test his theory, Shaw picked up one of his fish and tossed it closer to the Bigfoot. It seemed like he had guessed right, as immediately the smallest one came and collected the fish and took it back to the other two. Relieved, Shaw then threw another fish and a third one, each time the smallest Bigfoot picked them up. Then, while Shaw reached his last fish and turned around, the creatures were gone, disappeared into the forest. At that moment, Shaw grabbed his things and hightailed it out of there. He went around the lake and grabbed his friends, saying that they had to get out of the area right away. As they returned to the campsite, three other friends were already there, all freaking out. Apparently, they had come across the same three similar creatures. So four of the five people in the group had seen the Bigfoot. And the last person made it very clear he was not interested in seeing them. What the others were telling him was enough. And so Shaw and his friends packed their things and left. Kelly's grandfather told him that it usually took three days in 
and then three days out from the camp. Now, it only took them one and a half days to return. It took several decades before Shaw finally realized what he had witnessed that day. In the 1960s, he saw the infamous Patterson-Gimlin film and was like, hey, this is what I saw that day at Mount St. Helens. Kelly has said that his grandfather told him the story of the three Bigfoot dozens of times, and it was what eventually made him get into the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch organization and become a Bigfoot enthusiast. Due to this particular story and many other sightings of similar creatures roaming around Mount St. Helens, many thought after the 1980 eruption, there had to been casualties amongst Bigfoot too, which meant there should have been Bigfoot bodies, and yet there were no official reports of the discovery of this mysterious creature. But did that mean they never existed, or somebody was just trying to hide that they did? Now here's where things get really interesting, and we're going to go through a few statements from people who were allegedly present at Mount St. Helens after its eruption, and they all saw something very interesting. The first report is from an anonymous National Guardsman who lived in Spokane, Washington in 1980. He was 24 years old at the time when he was placed on a special cleanup crew that was positioned further up on Mount St. Helens. According to him, their tent was guarded by armed soldiers. Actually, there were a lot of soldiers at the scene, and a lot of them were not part of the guard. The guardsmen said that they were given a strange brief by a soldier who said they should forget about him and what he said at the end of the mission. The guardsmen and four others were then told to follow a group of soldiers and keep quiet. They were ordered to sit in a jeep where they waited for half an hour. Finally, another jeep arrived carrying a civilian and another military member. The civilian was then taken into a tent, and after he emerged a short time later, he was followed by a large, hairy creature. At this point, I would like to remind you that this statement was made by a National Guardsman, a first-hand account. Apparently, the creature looked like the beast from X-Men, just brown instead of blue. It seemed to have some injuries and had a bandage on its arm. Understandably, the guardsmen and others were scared at first, but in the end, the creature did not seem to possess any threat to them. If anything, it looked kind of sad and melancholy. The statement then continued saying that the civilian and the creature climbed into the back of a pickup truck and the two were speaking with some strange language that the guardsmen had never heard before. He also added that the large, hairy being would cough at times. So let's stop here for a moment. If a human were actually talking with this creature with an unknown language, that would have meant that the relationship between humans and Bigfoot would have been going on for a while. Did it mean the government had been studying them in silence? Nevertheless, the guardsmen stated that they followed the pickup to different areas around Mount St. Helens and stopped five times in total. Every time, the creature would get up together with the civilian and walk to rocky areas and into caves. The creature would make a sound in its own language and wait, possibly for its kind to answer. But there was no reply. Each time, it would look back to the civilian and then on the ground. It appeared like the others like him were missing. But then, at one of the stops, everyone heard a subdued response coming from the cave. Two soldiers went inside, and after a few minutes, they came back carrying another creature that seemed to be badly burned. The first creature stepped close to the other and looked at it for a long time, for about five minutes before saying something to the civilian and walking back to the truck. The guardsman and his colleagues were told to follow, and as they walked away, they heard a shot behind them. A soldier had put the injured creature out of its misery. There was also a response at the last stop. This time, a soldier carried out another creature that had an injury to its left leg. The guardsman continued saying that they were ordered to help place the creature on a very large stretcher and carry it back to the truck. The group then returned to the base camp, and the guardsman and his colleagues were ordered to wait in the jeep for the debrief. While doing so, 
they saw the creature waving at them, like saying thank you. Needless to say, when the guardsmen and the others were told to exit the jeep, everyone was in shock. During the debrief, a soldier simply explained to them how things were. Apparently, he said, that the creatures lived in the area. They meant no harm to humans and just wanted to be left alone. In many ways, Bigfoot are like us, he said. In the end, the soldier added that everyone should keep what they saw at Mount St. Helens a secret for some time. Not forever, but right then was not the right time. The guardsman continued saying, We were then ordered back to the guard camp because they were breaking it up, so nobody saw too much and knew everything that happened. We did not speak of it, and after a few months, I just took the attitude that these things live out there, and honestly, my life is no different because of it. I only bring it up now because people have been writing a lot about Mount St. Helens, and I believe that the whole story should be told. I will also say this. I like to camp and hike and have done so many times throughout the Northwest. Every time I would look for signs of these creatures, tracks, listen for sounds, etc. I never saw or heard anything other than what I did that day on Mount St. Helens. Another account comes from Linda Coyle Suchi, who's watching you, an exploration of the Bigfoot phenomenon in the Pacific Northwest. Details a story from Mr. Bradshaw, whose father was a supervisor for Weyerhaeuser. After the eruption of Mount St. Helens, he was sent to Spirit Lake to help keep the curious folks out of the way of a helicopter landing zone. He describes how the National Guard was collecting the carcasses of dead animals and piled them up for eventual cremation. Until that, the corpses were covered with tarps. Here's a citation from Linda's book about what happened. Mr. Bradshaw was placed in charge of one pile of dead animals in particular. The pile was covered, and no one was allowed to come near it. Armed U.S. National Guard personnel were guarding this pile. On the day that they were going to move this group of bodies, Bradshaw was standing close to the pile and was told to keep his mouth closed about what he was to witness. When the tarps were removed, he was amazed to see that the bodies were those of Sasquatch, some badly burned and some not. They were placed in a large net and lifted into the back of a truck, which was then tarped over. Bradshaw asked a guardsman what would happen to the bodies, and the guardsman replied, they'll study them or whatever, I don't know. It's like other stuff, you don't ask. Later that day, his father and the rest were debriefed, told not to talk about what they had witnessed, and sent home. What connects these two stories, the first one from the guardsman and now Mr. Bradshaw, is the incredible amount of detail. The first statement even mentioned the creature coughing and that one of them had a burned left leg. Not just the leg, but the left leg. It is quite unlike a story that somebody would just come up with without actually having seen what they described. And the reports do not end there. Another account details some dredging in the Cowlitz River two months after the eruption. Apparently, two Bigfoot corps were found in the sand, and a helicopter associated with the Army Corps of Engineers came and removed them. And then there was a man who was visiting his aunt, who lived outside of Spokane, near Fairchild Air Force Base. One day, he saw a big double-rotor helicopter flying over at 100 to 150 feet with a cargo net hanging below. In that net, the man said he saw Bigfoot bodies. According to him, he got a real good look at them. The witness saw hairy ash arms and legs hanging from the net. Apparently, this man reported the sighting to several federal agencies, only to get threatening phone calls as a return, saying, There are no Bigfoot or Sasquatch parts in there. In addition, decades after Mount St. Helens eruption, the Freedom of Information Act was filed by people interested in the case and what really happened back then, to see if there was any official reports to support witness reports. As expected, the response was generic and not very informative. There were no documented reports of Bigfoot or Sasquatch carcasses, and there were no projects to attempt to locate and or recover any bodies. 
The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers were also contacted to find out about dredging in the Cowlitz River in the summer of 1980, but their response was as short. We don't know. Check with the National Archives. If these comments were meant to convince somebody over many reported sightings of the Bigfoot corpses that they never existed, it did not really work, especially because sightings of Bigfoot have continued around Mount St. Helens, meaning not all of these creatures perished after the eruption after all. 